training and then serving. So just to state, there's, there's obviously lots of tools out there to manage data, great tools, you know, Pandas, HDFS, and great tools for training. TensorFlow, which we use um, a lot, and other tools. And we're really focused on the serving side. So after you've done the training of your machine learning model, and more importantly, as I probably say several times, we don't want to limit how you do your training in terms of what tools you use, whether we use TensorFlow or Skykit Learn or other tools. We want to be able to be completely compatible with all these tools and then help you on the serving side to put it into production and manage that uh, machine learning in production so you can iterate through your uh, uh, models and manage scale, etc. Um, so just to go over some of the challenges um, that we're trying to solve, so just to sort of situate uh, where the open source product sold and caught is, is um, trying to solve, um, these are some of them. So obviously we want to be able to manage you, uh, allow you to launch and scale and, and do rolling updates to your machine learning uh, um, models in production and do those so there's no downtime, so there's still requests coming in all the time. So handle that completely. So you've got 24 seven um, machine learning models running and do health checks and recovery. So when the models go down, get them automatically recovered so that, that, you've, got, that you've got all that aspects of like a redundant service that you need to run in production. Also to help you um, manage infrastructure. So to allow you to optimize the number of machines you need to run the, the uh, deployments. If you're running several different types of deployments, obviously you want to decrease costs and, and, and um, put all the different uh, predictions you're running on a set of uh, servers that um, maximizes that server throughput. So that's quite important. And um, we're definitely um, focused on um, managing latency optimization. So we're definitely focused on sort of low latency um, synchronous requests coming in, that's our real focus. And so that's something you need to, to manage, obviously, to get that throughput as well as saving you money and getting a good response time uh, uh, to the business apps, which will be um, using your machine learning models in production. And obviously, those business apps need to connect to the machine learning model. So um, you would probably want to connect by REST and GIPC, and we, we um, um, handle both of those in, in Seldom Core. I can go into more details if you don't know what uh, GRPC is and stuff, but it's basically a faster, bu faster binary protocol uh, than REST. Um, and one thing we really want to allow and want to um, that makes Selden Core stand out is that you can deploy quite complex graphs. And I'll show um, like a demo later in this webinar of um, different types of graphs you can um, put into, into production. So um, the sort of graphs that we want to manage are. Um, so you might want to, rather than just a single model, you might want to have like an A-B test. So you can send, send requests to different models um, or do something more complex, as I'll show later. You might, you might want to transform your data, you know, do feature normalization and have a separate component that manages that before it gets to the model. And you might want to have various models running and um, ensemble those results together uh, to get like a, to have several models solving this, the same task and then get the results together, merge the results into, into a final prediction. We want you to allow you to really create complex graphs and I'll show some of these. Um, yeah, so obviously you need to decide how you are, um, what sort of uh, modalities you're gonna um, um, put your machine learning into production. So there's various options here and we're really focused on the first one, synchronous. So synchronous API requests where you've got a live machine learning model and you've got API requests coming in from your business app in real time and you need to give a prediction. That's what Seldon Core is really focused on at the moment. In the future, we might also look at asynchronous requests, so um, feeding off some sort of queue and sending results back to a queue. But at the moment, the open source is just focused on synchronous requests. We, are, we do allow in the open source batch requests as well, so you can send in a batch of predictions, to a batch of um, features to be sent to your model to get a set of predictions back. So that's definitely there. Um, but we're not probably covering the offline case, which is where you might have like several million um, features that you just want to run over from disk and run your model over it and output back to disk uh, the results. Uh, that's probably a better case for, for, for tools like Spark and, and, and Flink and stuff. It's not really focused on that. We're really focused on low latency, live APIs connected to um, various business apps. Um, and then we, it's really key to do some of the core stuff you need to, to put these into production, like having clear auditing and versioning. And I'll show how Selden Core um, 
helps you to do that. And um, this is all something we're really focusing on in our future product, Seldom Deploy, which will be a higher level product that sits on top of Seldom Core. Um, but obviously, in the um, areas that we work in a lot, like with, with banks and financial services, they're, they're very risk averse. So you, they need to know for every update to a model they put into production, have really clear auditing of that model. What has changed? What, what, what has the um, um, data scientist done um, between the previous version and this version uh, before it's actually approved to be put into production? And obviously, with clear versioning, you can then roll back if things do happen to go wrong and go to, back to a previous version. I'll show how some of the tools in the open source help you solve that. And we want to tie into continuous integration and, and continuous deployment. So all the technologies that exist out there and, and, and are um, uh, working very successful with standard um, software projects that are, are running. We want to use those and allow you to use those for uh, machine learning um, production scenarios as well. And I'll show you how that fits in at the end of these slides. And then we want to allow quite complex things that you can build up and, and, and put into production to help your machine learning, uh, um, to give you better, more information about how your model is running. And this, these are various things that we're working on, um, but are also part of the open source definitions. And so you can also work on these and other, other people can um, um, contribute these um, aspects. So things like concept drift. So you might want to check in real time whether your accuracy of your model is dropping. So that might be an indicator that you might need to retrain, for instance, because the, um, the features being received are not the same as what you trained on. So you'll be able to just plug in a concept drift module into your live runtime and get that extra information. Or you might want to plug in a bias detection to check your models are not biased with some aspects, some aspects of some, some features like gender, which obviously would not be part of your model, say, but it might be using other, other features to proxy for gender. So you could plug that in just to give you checks there. Even in, either in development or in um, production. And um, outlier detection, some of our data scientists are working on that right now, and it should go into the open source in the next week or two. So you can plug that module in, and it will give you um, alerts when there's outliers. Um, um, so it'll work out a um, distribution for your model's features as it sees them coming through in real time. And then as, it, and then as new features come in for new predictions, if they seem to be outliers, it'll add, a, it'll add extra metadata to illustrate that. And then other things like, um, so, so optimization, so not just A-B tests, but more complex forms of optimization, which I'll illustrate later in the, in the demo. So you actually push uh, traffic to the best performing models you have in real time. So yeah, as I say, just to clarify what, where we are as a company in terms of products. So Selden Core is the open source. Uh, um, so that's on GitHub. You can check out now and it's in further development. And that's what I'm discussing today. And then future, probably later this year, we'll be bringing out Cell and Deploy, which is a much higher level product with more graphical interface where you can, where you can work at building up these machine learning graphs in a much higher level, high level way. So the Cell and Core is quite low level and that's what sort of low level, um, that's what your data scientists would work with directly. But obviously um, in the future, we'd like a, a wider range of people who have interest in, in the um, machine learning products within your company to be able to, to work and um, audit and understand what's happening as well. Um, so I've added one slide from what we discussed uh, a few days ago, and that's just to have a description of Kubernetes, as I understand that some of you are probably not so familiar with it, because we use Kubernetes as our base um, infrastructure to, to run our software. And Kubernetes um, basically came out about five, six years ago from Google, and is a hugely successful um, um, a project now. Uh, it's got thousands of committers and um, um, so many thousands of companies using it in production uh, for many years. Basically what it is, it's, it's basically um, an orchestrator for Docker. So Docker, hopefully you understand, is, is allows you to um, collect your software and all, all the dependencies into a container um, and um, actually build an image of all those dependencies and that, 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 that set of software you need to run, say like a web server or, or some other piece of software and then run it anywhere. On, on a platform that supports Docker. So that's, that's great and that's fine. And, and um, Docker has been a huge success, but the, but the problem is the next stage, any complex ap application, including machine learning, normally requires many, many components that need to talk to each other and fit together and be orchestrated over a, a whole set of machines. So you need some platform that can allow you to describe what are all the components that make up your um, application that you want to run at scale and um, then a deploy it for you to really take away a lot of the pain of DevOps of actually scaling up large complex applications. 
and Kubernetes is, is um, probably the market leader here in terms of providing that orchestration. So you can um, give it a set of machines from one to tens of thousands of machines that it's been run on. Um, and it will, it will um, automatically help you to deploy your applications over those machines, um, allow you to control that. And really the key thing is that's a huge advantage in a way. It's quite theoretical, but it, allow, it does that by allowing you to um, declaratively de define the infrastructure. So rather in, in previous years, you would have um, sort of procedurally defined your infrastructure, say do this, then do that, then download this software, then run this. That's, that's a very brittle way of, of running it and things can break and you're not sure what part of, of you, what part has been done, what part hasn't been done. Whereas in Kubernetes, everything is de defined declaratively in a JSON or YAML file. So it's, it's basically just a de declarative description of what I would like to see running on my set of servers. Then it's up to Kubernetes and software like Seldon's Core to actually take that description and make it happen. And you can at the same time also look at, so okay, this is my description, what is actually running on my um, set of machines and see what the differences are and see if there's any issues as well. So obviously, so Kubernetes is taking your description and, and trying to set up everything so it, it's satisfied your description and it will, it will give you status updates as to whether it's, it's when it's done it and this, um, things like that. So basically, just that small thing of being of having a declarative API is like a huge step forward, I think, for um, DevOps to be, for everything to be um, described and um, it really helps with auditing, as, I should, as I'll show you later. So hopefully that's giving you a quick background to um, Kubernetes. So just to, to clarify what's in the open source uh, right now, these are the core aspects. Um, I think I said much most of them. So it uses Kubernetes and it uses the standard APIs in Kubernetes. So if you, maybe everyone here today is not familiar with Kubernetes, but if you have someone who was familiar with Kubernetes, they would say they would be able to use the standard APIs that already exist in Kubernetes to deploy Seldon Core machine learning models. So there would be nothing new in terms of the tools they would have to use. So that's, that's great for them. They don't have to learn anything new. And um, so basically what we're doing is just extending Kubernetes to allow new types of things to be deployed on top of it. And I'll, I'll show more of that later. Um, just to clarify again, as I said, I'll say this several times, we want to um, allow you to use a wide range of machine learning tools. So any of those listed there and more, you know, our models and other, other things. We, and so you can continue to build your models as you do now. We, we don't um, restrict that in any way. And then we, you can run them on server and core. And then complex graphs, which I'll show you. And everything is automatically exposed over REST and gRPC. So you can use those, um, choose which, which one of those um, APIs you use and tie it into your business app. So this is the stack. So yeah, as you say, we run on top of Kubernetes. And that means, um, one thing I didn't say, Kubernetes runs on any of the clouds and, and other um, so lesser known clouds. So you can run it anywhere and you can run it on premise as well. If you just give it a set of machines, you can set up Kubernetes on, set up a, on, a, on, on those set of machines. And you can add, the whole point is you can add and take away machines and you know, it's all um, sort of dynamic infrastructure that can be um, orchestrated over. And you can move between these. So you might start in the cloud because you might start using Google because uh, they've got very good tooling for Kubernetes to try it out. And then you could use the same description, your same application and move it on premise later if you wish with no changes or hardly any changes are, um, at all. Um, maybe small changes for the underlying disks and you know, the file systems that you would need to use might be different. The file systems you use on premise might be like using so NFS for instance. Whereas in Google, you might be using sort of Google um, persistent storage. But apart from that, everything would be exactly the same. Um, so yeah, so above that, we have Seldon Core running, which sits, sits on top of Kubernetes. Um, then there's Istio, which is some optional stuff I won't really discuss today, which is um, stuff where it's a project coming out of Google to help to give you fine grain control over uh, microservice um, service meshes. So sets of microservices running together, which covers what we're doing really here in terms of machine learning deployments, different models and components that need to talk to each other. Um, and we are looking to integrate with, with one service mesh, made might be Istio, there's a few competing projects in this area to give you fine grain control as well. Because again, the reason for that is we don't want to be um, overlapping in some of the um, aspects that exist in parts of these projects. Um, but just want to say we are definitely compatible with these uh, projects if, if, you, if you know them. Um, and then the top of the Southern Core, as I said, there's various plugins that you can push in that will be there to, to allow you to extend the capabilities of what you want to do at one time. And in the future, Southern Deploy, which we won't really discuss too much today. So this is the um, API, uh, so, so the um, core in architecture of um, how it fits together. 
So over on the right, you have a Kubernetes cluster of so multiple machines. And then your data scientists and DevOps can use the standard tools um, that you use already, um, or, or, or they used to um, um, communicate to Kubernetes over its API to, to deploy machine learning deployments using the, the standard Kubernetes API. And basically, we have a little piece of software, which is the technical um, term is an operator that runs inside the cluster. And as these, these cell and deployments come in, which is stuff that we understand about, we see them coming in and then we, we say, okay, here's something that we understand. And we then create your underlying, the, the underlying components in Kubernetes, the low level components, which like services and pods and deployments, which are all lower level Kubernetes components that, that it can manage. Um, and then um, it would then, um, so that, basically would we basically deploy your graph out there and manage it and at the same time we're using a piece of um, software which is a reverse proxy um, called ambassador uh, which would then automatically expose your uh, models via AP, um, rest or grpc and the great thing about of buying into that technology um, is that it has um, pluggable authentication so you could use oauth2 you could use um, the authentication that comes in with um, Google's cloud or, or some other authentication that can be all plugged in with no changes to, to any of this. You just, um, it's very easy to define. And so we're using that. Um, so we don't have to worry, worry too much about the authentication. Actually in the open source, we do have an alternative, which is our own API server, which exposes um, REST and gRPC um, via OAuth2. Um, so just limited to OAuth2. So you can use that if you wish um, and you're happy with OAuth2 or um, I think in the next um, month or so, we'll probably move over um, to being fully um, going down the line of, of ambassador as we really like that. And um, that, again, it's all about taking stuff away so we can, we can concentrate on the machine learning part. So um, it's all Dockerized, so all your models would be uh, Docker images, and I'll show you how that, those are created, give an example later. Um, so that, that would all, so as the, as the graph is constructed, it would be pulling in the Docker images from, you know, um, your private registry, maybe some from public registries, and maybe some from our cell and Docker registry, in together orchestrating those up in, into components that will be running, which we manage, and exposing it all all, all automatically. Um, so that's that. Um, so I just want to spend a few minutes describing these complex graphs. I keep talking about to give you examples of them. So in our um, open source, we define four, essentially four types of component that can build up your runtime graph. The most obvious one is models. So that's the most obvious thing you build, you know, a TensorFlow model or whatever, and that's packaged up and you can, that's part of the graph. But also we have a, a thing called a router, which would cover anything where it, it, as a request comes in, it decides where the request is going to go onto in, in the graph that is below it. So that would cover things like A-B tests or multi-arm bandits. And in the demo later, I'll give an example of both of those. Um, and we have that one called combiners, which is basically managing the responses back from uh, lower parts of the graph. So coming back up from the models. So that could be examples of that would be ensemblers that would be taking results from two models, combining them and pushing them further up the tree. And then finally, we have transformers, uh, which essentially would be the most obvious thing would be feature, feature transformation, feature normalization, which you have a little component that you might write to do that as part of your graph. But more complex things that um, would be things that would actually trans transform perhaps the responses. So you might have an outlier detection like we're working on. It, it, it sees the um, request coming through it and does some magic to build up a distribution of what it's seeing. And then as the response comes back, if it thinks that it is an outlier what it's seen in this response, it will add a little bit of metadata saying outlier one or something, maybe give you further, extra, further information about the responses, why it thinks it's an outlier, and send it back up. So you can easily plug these things in to do more complex aspects. Um, so, so here's some examples, it, just to hopefully clarify this, what we're talking about. So the top left um, is just the most simplest case, just a model. Fine, you can you put that into production and we'll expose it via APIs. Um, a more complex case would be a router, say an A-B test or a multi arm bandit, which is routing quests as they come in. You can imagine these diagrams, the request comes in from the top and so the A-B test says, okay, send this request to model A, another one comes in and says, okay, send it to model B. Each one of those does its stuff, and it comes back up the tree, the response comes back out. So that's how to view these graphs. 
right? Here's just a example of a more complex case. You might have request comes in, it goes through outlier detection. Um, then there's maybe a module created by yourselves, which does feature transformation. It goes on down, then there's maybe another module created by yourselves, which does feature-based routing. Maybe if the request has a feature that says it's coming from Poland, send it to the left, or as it's coming from England, send it to the right, because there's two different models for those two countries. And then it maybe goes through another component that we're building, um, concept drift, which is checking the accuracy of the models. And it, I, at the moment, it won't do, wouldn't do anything. We'll just send the request on, goes to model A, which then does its stuff. This is created by you to, to do the machine learning uh, prediction. You send back a response for the prediction. It would then go through. If, if the concept drift thinks things are changing, it might add a bit of metadata there. Goes back up here. These wouldn't do anything on the response. Goes back up through here. Get to the outlier detection. And that, if you thought this request that had, that had come in was an outlier, it might add a little bit of metadata and push it out. And that would go back out through the API. Clive, we've, Clive, um, we've had sorry. a request for information on deploying just a single model. Um, so explaining kind of the the the, the pipeline for the deploying a single model into production with cell and yeah sure and um, so i'll um go over that in the um, demo uh, of the actual the actual pipeline what you would do um so in a few seconds so yeah that's definitely the core part as that might be a large percentage of your use cases um but the use but the, the um, core aspect is that you sh you should be able to iterate between these you might start with a single model go to multiple or do an a b test go back to a single model create a more complex graph and go back I want to allow you to manage that um, yeah, easily and freely. So here's a description of what the actual, those Kubernetes resources look like. Uh, it looks pretty complex, but basically it's, it's, a, it's a declarative description of that graph and the components that make it up. And really there's two parts. Um, one is the graph here down the bottom, uh, which def defines the components um, that you want to put into production. So here's the example of a single a single model as you are, as, um, someone asked in the questions. This would just be a single model. You give it a name, you say it's a microservice and it's gonna be of type REST. And then in this second part, the component spec, you, this is pure um, Kubernetes. Um, so if, if you were familiar with Kubernetes, this would be just a standard definition of a pod, as they say in Kubernetes, which describes, say, the image. So this is your Docker image. In this case, it's coming from the Selden IO Docker Hub repo, and that's the name of the image and the version. And it's, um, it has a name, this name has to match the graph, so that's how the two things tie together, components in the graph. And it's, this model, for instance, is requesting one megabyte of memory. You might have other requests, you might say it needs a GPU, or it needs a certain amount of CPU power, etc. You might add things like um, sort of persistent storage here, the disks it needs to have, or, or other things in Kubernetes like secrets that it needs to get because it needs to call something else, some API and use some secret information to call it out. So you can put that all in there, basically. This is standard Kubernetes uh, uh, JSON. Um, so obviously this is quite low level. Um, I mean, this is what um, people do to construct their um, uh, infrastructure definitions, but in future in cell and deploy, it will be all the graphical interface. Uh, so that's that. And um, so just to what you do, uh, this is up, will, will partially answer that question of the steps. Um, so the first step is, okay, you've built your model, your, your training, and you've got a runtime component that's going to take your model parameters and give a prediction. You've written in any of these or, or others, as we, as we said, components that you, that you, that you use. And then all, all, all that's required is that it's dockerized and is exposed via a REST or gRPC. And so what we provide as part of the open source is we'll, we'll give standard wrappers for these uh, different components, the ones that are most popular. Um, to allow you to do that really easily. So you can just take your one-time component and I'll show you an example and wrap it up and um, put it into a, a Docker container and expose it via REST or GRPC and save it as an image, push it to your Docker repo. And that mean, and once that's there, then it can be used as part of a graph definition. So the second part would be to define that graph, which is defining essentially this thing here. Here we've got an image of something from this cell and deploy design. So as you see, you'll be able to create that graph graphically just by drag and drop. But at the moment with the open source, it will be like this. You define your graph of how it makes up. And we have examples of that to make it easy to, for you to define those components and it's clearly to, um, describe the components you need to describe there. Um, once that's done, you can use the, um, the Kubernetes API to deploy it and um, then um, send requests for it and monitor it, et cetera and get information and then go back. And then the whole point is you then go back for the loop, get information, get learnings from using that in development or production, 
and then update your model maybe and go through the loop again, push out a new version, maybe give it you know changes here and go through that loop again and again. Uh, so this is almost at the end of the slide. So this is just the API, the external API. So there's probably two parts, the internal API, which you need to um, define, you need to conform to, to put your things into the graph. This is the external API that your business apps would talk to. There's two methods, predict, which is where you'd send in your features to get a prediction from the model. We allow three uh, or four different types of data to come in as the payload to cover different use cases. One is tensor, so just a shaped set of floats. So um, it's pretty standard, covers a lot of use cases. But we also allow um, ND array, which is basically an array of arrays. Um, this will be used if you have multi-type data. So if you have strings and numbers that you need to send in as part of your feature, then you'd have, need to use this one. Obviously, you couldn't just use a tensor of floats for that. And it's probably the most easy one to send as JSON because it really is just a JSON array of arrays um, of, of uh, uh, values that you send in. And finally, we allow um, custom strings or binaries of whatever nature. And so, you can, so if these two don't apply, you can send in whatever you want as this custom uh, value. The only caveat with the final one is that, that if you use our components, like say, if, we, if you want to use our outlier detector, it obviously needs to understand the data that's flowing through it. So you, you'd have to have either a tensor or ND array. Uh, but if you just had your own components that, that are, which are part of the graph, you could just send through custom stuff that's, that only, only your components understand. So you're free to do what you want there. Uh, so that's what comes in and, and the same structure comes back um, in terms of the response, the same structure because it's quite generic. Um, and there's a second endpoint, which is for sending feedback. So feedback is used for more, some of the more complex um, components of your graphs so that they can get information of what's working and what's not working. So for that, you send, you, so you, imagine you sent a prediction and got back a response. For feedback, you send the request that you sent in, the response you got back, and then you send in um, a reward. So this would be like what, whether the, the prediction was correct or not. You found out whether the prediction was request, maybe later. Maybe you have a fraud detection, you said, and the model says this transaction is fraudulent. Um, then maybe several minutes or hours later, you, you realize it's not fraudulent. You can send that back to the system saying, okay, in this case, the reward would be zero if it got it wrong and maybe one if it got it right. And so that, that way you can use more complex things inside the graph to actually do real-time optimization, but also you can use that for your um, analytics just to get information on what models are working and not. And I'll show some examples of that. Uh, so finally, uh, um, I just want to say how this would fit into CI and CD. So um, really the key, the key aspect is because everything's declarative using Kubernetes, you can store your infrastructure descriptions of what you want to deploy in a source control repo. Here this is um, like a Git repo. And that's all declarative and, and can be defined there. And you probably have another repo, which is your source code for your machine learning. Uh, both the training and the um, and the runtime part, and that would be there. So as your data science up, the data scientist upstates their models, that can kick off standard continuous integration pipelines, which maybe train the model and do testing, and then would also maybe run our wrappers to wrap the model up so it can be turned into a Docker image. That Docker image would be pushed to a repo somewhere, either public or private. And then you could then have part of, then there could be automatically triggers that trigger from that, that say, okay, there's a new image, I'm gonna update my infrastructure description. So for instance, you would update this. So you've got this, your cell now mean classifier, if, it, if there was a 0.7 had been created, you could essentially just need to update this um, uh, definition of your model, uh, your cell deployment to say 0.7, and then you can then deploy that onto Kubernetes and it would update in real time to the new model. But the, the key thing is because it's all declarative now, your infrastructure, you, cannot, you, can, do, you can do auditing on this. Um, so you say, what is the difference between this version that's been committed and the previous version? You can also do rollbacks. So if, you, if something goes wrong, you could roll back to the previous version uh, just using standard source control techniques. So because this is all declarative and can be pushed into source control, it really gives you a huge amount. And there's a lot of tools that have been built on top of this to use that um, quite simple fact. Things like Weflux, this is one of our companies that we work quite closely with. They have a tool that, that sort of monitors a Git repo and an image repo. And when there's new images, it updates your um, Kubernetes manifests um, automatically and pushes them out to um, Kubernetes. And our cell and deploy product would also be doing something similar to tie these two together. 
So that's the end of the um, slide presentation. Um, and so um, what I want to go on to now is a more in-depth descri description of how you would go through and, and build up a training and uh, training and runtime and pushing that out um, into a live uh, system example. So this is because we're focused on purely the um, runtime, the actual deployment. Uh, this demo uses a um, sister project called Qflow, and it's actually on their repo, Qflow repo. So Qflow is basically a project that's come out of Google, um, also December, January time. And it's basically really a full ecosystem for allowing uh, machine learning on Kubernetes. And so as part of that, they want to use um, the various tools and toolkits that are, part, that are focused on solving machine learning on Kubernetes and allow those two tools to all work together. So obviously one of those would be Selden as well on the machine learning deployment side. And this is an example of using tools from Qflow um, as well as Selden to get end-to-end -end training. But just to clarify, you don't have to use Qflow. Um, you could use whatever tools you're using now and put them into Kubernetes to, to, to do your training. This is just an example of using Qflow um, um, to, to fill it through. And hopefully it will give you some sense of, of what you need to do to take this end to end. So we're gonna use the MNIST, the standard MNIST um, data set, which is um, hand drawn digits that you need to classify from zero to nine. Uh, pretty standard thing if, if you know machine learning. Um, and this, these are the steps. So I, I won't go through much of the start to set things up because that's pretty boring um, and it's pretty standard. So in this case, it's all gonna be on Google. So obviously you need to create your Google Kubernetes cluster and then you need to set up the software um, to, uh, to run both Qflow and Selden Core to run on that cluster. Um, as this is all in the Git repo, fork this repo. So if you want to um, make changes and, and push images to your own Docker Hub repo, so do all that. And then I'll get to the interesting part of doing the data science, training the model, serving the model and getting predictions, which is the core stuff. Um, so I'll skip over the um, steps that, that you can follow through. This is all um, on GitHub to try this out um, and get to the data science. So here for MNIST, we've got two models, just to show you there's different type of models that can run on Selden. So first we've got a simple TensorFlow model. Um, so we're in Python using TensorFlow uh, uh, library. Um, this is basically a single hidden layer neural network, very simple. This, it's not trying to be a, a great um, classifier, but it does reasonably well um, using TensorFlow. And you, it's trained on the MNIST uh, data, which, you, which is easy to get in, ten, in TensorFlow because you can just um, install it from Python. So it, it trains the model, and then it simply saves it onto disk. And in the case of GCP, I've got like a disk, um, disk set up as part of this um, demo that's where it can store the, store the um, data that's trained. So that's, stay, that's storing its parameters um, for the graph of, of this trained model with all the parameters for the neural network. Um, and then there's a second model, just jumping to a second model. There's a SkyKit learn model. There's also this in case, this in this case, it's a random forest um, classifier used to using SkyKit learn. Um, pretty standard just to, to, to do the same thing to classify the digits um, and it saves its, its, it, it saves itself to, again its parameters uh, to disk. Um, so now that what we interest for you hopefully is the runtime part. So this is the part that's going to be deployed into production. So to allow that to be managed by Selden for Python you just need to define a class. So this is the TensorFlow version and, and that class has to have a predict method which takes two arguments, a NumPy array, which would be the features coming in, and some feature names as which we pass in if there, if there are feature names as part of the request. Um, then you just do your stuff, so you write your stuff. Here it's um, going to just get predictions, and you can you can set everything up in like init call, pretty standard Python, so you can set things up and load the data. As I say, so this is the runtime part. It's gonna load the data uh, from disk, uh, the actual parameters for this model, um, get everything set up, which will obviously be called when this class is created, get everything set up, and then as predict methods come in, simply calls the TensorFlow to get a prediction, which, which in TensorFlow would return like a NumPy array, and you can simply just pass that back. So hopefully from that you can see it's, it, it's, not, it's, it's not difficult to um, conform to what we need to put things into production, just a predict method in a class. That's it, basically. And then just to, to show, the, show you the other one, which is even smaller, this is for the SkyKit Learn one. 
So it's a class for a predictive method. We load the class using the SkyKit learn job lib, and then just call predict method on that to get the predictions. Um, so the next, the next question you need to decide is how you actually do the workflow to actually train your model and um, put it in, in um, also do the runtime part to, to package those up into Docker containers. Um, so in this case, I'm going to show an example using a tool called Argo, as that's what Kubeflow, the project, ha has chosen to give illustration of how you do that. You, you, you could use other tools, just Argo works quite nicely on Kubernetes, but it's quite simple to use but you're free to use whatever tools that maybe fit into your standard um, um, sort of Jenkins or Travis um, um, sort of continuous integration, whatever you're using now to package your models. Um, as part of that, this Argo definition, um, basically there's a core bit that does the actual building of the Docker container. And this is just pretty standard. So you just build the Docker container, um, which is just gonna have a simple Docker uh, um, file that, that takes that, um, training part that I showed before, turns it, turns it into a Docker container and then um, pushes it um, um, to a repo under this, uh, under this name. And the, the actual repo and the version are passed into this argument, to, to this uh, little script. So just to go over in Argo um, how this looks, um, just go down here and just give you a run through of the Argo script, because this will be the same steps if you, even if you weren't using Argo. So it's a bit of setup, which is going to, you can, for this example, you can pass in your own GitHub user and your own Docker user. Um, to, so you can push things to your own Docker account. And um, if you fault, if you fault this project to your own GitHub account, then you can use that rather than using the one it's coming from. Um, this is secret volume. This, so Kubernetes allows secrets. This is so you can pass in your Docker credentials and there's some description um, in, in the docs of how you push that in so that this job can push the images to a, to a private Docker repo. And then really there's just two parts as you'd expect. This build and push my image um, that, for training and then actually run the training. So the build and push uh, basically just uses Git to, to, to um, download this, this, this um, project onto disk. Um, then it just runs that build and push script that I showed you earlier. That just simply build, builds and push the TensorFlow MNIST model that I showed earlier and pushes it to your Docker repo using your Docker username and password, which is passed in as part of the secret. Um, so that's that really. And then there's the final part, which is part of Kubeflow. So Kubeflow have extended Kubernetes to allow you to easily um, start TensorFlow jobs. So there's a, a similar description like I showed for cell and deployments. There's a similar thing they've done for TensorFlow jobs. And you can just start this off, this image that we've just pushed to our repo with the version that we've passed in and start that off and that will do the training. And Allowing this, you can also do uh, more complicated TensorFlow um, trainings, like if you had multiple TensorFlow workers that's running in um, distributed TensorFlow, you could also define that in here. So that's the training part. Um, the serving part is pretty much exactly the, the same, except it's, um, set, let me just, except it's gonna use our wrappers. So this is, this is the part where, where the wrappers come in. There's a little script I've written for the wrappers. So our wrappers for, the, for Python are basically just held in a um, Docker image. So you simply call that Docker image on those simple Python classes that I showed you earlier, and that just wraps it up. And then the rest is the same. You just build the image. It, it, it creates a directory build where you'll just call build image to build the image. Then you can push the image um, to your Docker repo. Um, and, that's, and that's that. So it's, it's e easy to wrap once you've got your class in, in the correct form. Um, and so the de details of this Argo workflow are pretty much the same. Um, there's a build and push part, which builds the runtime part, and there's a part to serve, which is to serve your model. So the build and push is exactly the same, except this kind of time it's calling wrap on the runtime part, you know, the runtime that's just um, going to run your model and get a prediction. So it wraps that into a Docker um, image and pushes it to the repo. And then the final part is a Seldon um, uh, manifest that hopefully should start to be familiar here with the graph and component spec. So again, it's very simple here. We're just going to um, launch the MNIST classifier using our image we've just built on its own. And see, there's a slightly more complexity here that just to show you, it's, it's, it's mounting um, this volume of which has the um, parameters uh, of your model. So it's using a, in um, Google, it's calling for the persistent volume claim that's been set up 
of NL data that both the training and then the, and then the runtime are reading from. So that's it. So once you've done that, that will be running and you can get predictions. So I'll show you an example of that. So we've got a little Python um, notebook here uh, for the MNIST. Um, so, so these are just examples of MNIST um, uh, digits. So I've got some code to do the TensorFlow model again, which I won't go through. And some examples here, which I won't go through here to actually submit those jobs, the training job, to actually run that on the cluster, train it, wait for it to be done. It takes a few minutes, so I, I won't do that. And also the runtime part that I just showed you, submit that runtime part, that will the package, the runtime part, and then push that onto the cluster. And then I've just got some Python code to actually call either the REST or gRPC. So let's, um, I've, I've already started this um, uh, TensorFlow model on the cluster, so we, we can call it. So basically what's happened, just to go through this in a bit of detail, what we've sent is a JSON array. We've sent it in that format that I said, because here's the data, and it's an ND array we're sending in this case, which has just taken um, the data from the, the TensorFlow images that are uh, available. We, we got one and we've reshaped it into a NumPy array of one by 1784. So that's, that's the size of the, Im the image data. And then we just turn that into a list and, and send that in. And then basically, if I just look at the code for the GRP, the, I'm sorry, the REST, it's very simple. It's just doing a REST call um, to Ambassador, which is, as I said, what is it about? A reverse proxy you give the um, deployment name that you've launched um, and just the API endpoint and you send that request in so in this case it was a six and that's this is the response that came back looks like it got it right that's the highest probability down here um, we try a different one hopefully it'll pick a different um, number seven uh, you see did I get it right uh, I might got that wrong actually so let's see the seven it's 10%. Yeah, it's actually thought it was a three. It's no, it thought it was a two. Now you can see why uh, slightly. Let's try another one. <laughs> seven. This case, yeah, it got a seven that time. It's probably easier for you to get that one. So that's REST requests. And just to say, because automatically um, using our uh, Southern Core, you have gRPC exposed as well. So I'll just do a gRPC request, which is using the gRPC API, and that's pretty similar, basically. The only difference is here was sending it as a tensor um, format in the payload. I'll just show, quickly show you that. So the gRPC request, yeah, so it's, see here's the tensor format rather than the ND array format where you give a shape, one by 784, and the data is a single set of um, array of floats. So that's all automatic. And so the next step is I want to just show you that you can start transferring that into more complex graphs. So let's... We've got two models that are, that, that are there. One, one was the SkyKit Learn model, and one is the TensorFlow model. So you can change your, your graph definition to one that um, 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 has both as an A-B test. So that would look like in cell and deploy like here. So rather than one model, we've got two now. We've got the deep MNIST classifier, which is the TensorFlow model, uh, which is gonna, has a volume amount for the data it needs. And we've got the SkyKit Learn model um, that we've packaged and then basically the graph is a bit different. It's going to use a built-in component called a random A-B test um, that has those two as children, the two models we want to do a random A-B test over, and we're going to send 50% of traffic to each of those. So this is a little graphical description of what that says above that graph. Um, so random A-B test with two models underneath, which are both REST models. So that um, definition defined, defined in that JSON I can just deploy using the Kubernetes um, command line client, the standard one, this is just part of Kubernetes. So it gets, gets deployed. Um, and here you'll see at the top here, it's the previous one was this one that's running. So that's still running. And then it's gonna be starting up this new one. Um, we also have a graphical using Weave. Um, this is Weave. This is a graphical interface that comes from the Weave company that's open source. So we've got our MNIST classifier running and uh, there should be a new one starting up. Uh, see it's got pods, two pods, our new one that's starting up and our old one um, to here. So that's all getting set up and that's quite useful to look at that as well. So let's just have a look. So now, yeah, so now we've got the new one running and it's terminating the old one and now just the new one is running. So there was no downtime, it's just done it that completely. Um, so requests could be coming in all the time as that. So just to show you that running, 
Um, first, you, you can check the status, obviously, via the, stand the Kubernetes API. So we've asked for one replica, and one's available. And now what I'm going to do is send 100 requests to that AB, AB test and see where they go. Because it's, can we just go to do a single request first, just quickly? Uh, I can just run this one again. But this will be running to the AB test now. So it's part of the metadata that comes back. It gives a routing, of which, which, where it went. So this went to model number one. Um, so you can use that to see where you're, which one is, was chosen, model zero or model one. So it's probably model zero. Oh, I forget which is, yeah, which is which. But no, I think model one in this case probably is this first one here. It starts from one, not zero. Um, and so we can send 100 requests, which I'll start. And then we can see what, from the metadata that comes back where, they've, where, where they were actually routed to which model. And then we can just show that on a little graph. Um, so let's wait to get to there. And then here, this is the number of requests. Either the, if it was sent to model zero, model one, and as you can see, it's pretty much split the traffic between the two. So that was set up. Now let's try something more complex. Let's do a multi arm bandit. Um, so this is a multi arm bandit definition. Again, for multi arm bandits, it takes the two models. But now we're going to use this extra thing as part of Selden, which is a router, but it's, it's, it's done, does something more complex. This is a silent, greedy, multi arm bandit. What, what it's, this is going to do is look at the requests and using feedback, it's going to work out which model is running best. And if one model is running is more accurate than the other, it'll start feeding all the traffic just to that one model. So the graph is pretty similar to previous times, but here instead of a random A-B test, we've set up a router, uh, we set up the um, multi arm bandit with a few parameters it, it needs. And the graph looks like this. So this, the structure of the graph is the same but we just changed this top component to be a more complex component. So we can then just take that JSON I showed you above and apply it. Um, so again, um, here we go. So it's, it's, it's creating it. We still got the other one running and it will be setting itself up uh, to run. And what I'm gonna do now is gonna, I'm gonna send 100 requests again, but a bit more complex. I'm going to see what the result was coming back and so I'm, I'm going to take the routing, where we, which, which model it went to, but I'm also going to look at the result that came back. And, and because obviously I'm using the MNIST data, I can see if it was correct, whether we got the um, digit correct or not. And if it did get correct, um, I can um, send back some feedback. You know, I said there was a feedback API, so I can send back a feedback over the API saying, great, this was the request, this is the response, and I'm going, going to give you like a reward of one, you got it right. If you got it wrong, I'm going to send it back and give it a reward of zero. And this is what that multi arm bandit needs to understand. Ah, oh, because it will see stuff coming back. Say, so, oh, this model was getting it right. This model was getting it wrong. And so we can, let's just see if it's started up. So yeah, it's running now, just that uh, multi arm bandit. It'd be a bit slower because it's sending um, requests and then a feedback for each, um, for each, for each call. But it'll be going through and then calculating which uh, sending that feedback. So now we should see if the multi arm bandit is changing where the routing is. Whereas before for the A-B test, it was 50-50. Now the multi arm bandit should be being, being more intelligent. It should be just sending requests to the model that's best um, rather than the one that's, that's wrong, that's not so good. And as you can see, these are the requests, the 100 requests. Most of them were going to model one which is, I think, the TensorFlow model, which is better, which is a better model. The um, SkyKit model is a pretty basic model. Um, so hopefully that's shown you that you can iterate through different complex graphs and add in extra functionality, which, is, which is, um, gives you a lot of extra benefit um, for your machine learning deployments. And that is the end of the demo. Thank you, Clive. Appreciate that. Um, uh, I'm going to unmute everybody so that um, uh, you're able to put your questions uh, so if you have um, uh, any questions that you want to put to, uh, to me or more specifically Clive around the platform, happy to take them now. Uh, okay, I, I think that uh, no questions from uh, our side uh, right now. Uh, what we do, uh, we'll, I will make some uh, short workshop beginning next week so we, we can uh, share uh, between the team uh, what we understand and uh, how we see the possibility to use Seldon in our current uh, uh, solution. And then we'll come back to you uh, with our questions or uh, Okay, very good. Um, is there anything today that you saw that might 
uh, that it isn't complementary, it isn't uh, compatible with uh, the way that Vata works uh, at the moment? I, I don't know if we, I can answer it uh, right now. Uh, I think it's... Uh, it's uh, we have to talk with uh, IT guys, yes, project management, so... We'll come back uh, with the answer. But definitely materials you, you are sharing uh, will help us. Very Everybody good. Understand. Very good, very good. Okay, uh, so what we'll do is we'll follow up with a share of the webinar video, uh, the slide material that Clive was kind enough to present, and the GitHub links um, uh, and notebooks. Yeah, great, great. Thank you. Very good. Thank you for your time, guys. Thanks, Clive. Yes. Thank you. For the okay, cheers. Have a good day. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Okay.